What's up, everyone? We just got done filming an epic episode with the Cat Cole. Went into so much cool stuff, had some really cool frameworks around building a startup where you come down from what the big companies have and build that for the small guys. What'd you have, Greg? I like the MMDD framework. Made my day difficult. I thought that was brilliant. Super quick, easy win to ask your employees to make the experience more fun, more enjoyable, more rewarding. So many cool startup ideas coming out of this one. You guys are gonna love it. Let's dive right in. The saying used to be, let your game speak. With Common Stock, it's about let your gains speak. I love Common Stock, love the platform, and have really been enjoying learning from other people on there. How does it work? It's a platform for verified investment knowledge. So people are going and sharing their ideas, sharing their trades, but it's actually connected to their brokerage account. So you can see the results they're generating and see their actual track records over time. So you're learning from people, not only the best investors, the Bill Ackmans, the Daniel Loeb's are on there, but also individuals who are actually going and putting their money where their mouth is on these trades and you're learning alongside them and being taken on the journey. Is it just stocks? There's everything now. There's going to be stocks. There's crypto. We're in this crazy world where there's so many different investment opportunities, which just means there's so many opportunities to learn. And Common Stock is creating the platform for you to learn alongside the best. And also, as I said, let your gains speak. So to level up your investing game today, check out CommonStock.com. You won't regret it. CapChase is the financing solution for fast-growing startups. It lets companies access their revenue today so that they can reinvest in their business and grow and scale much quicker than they otherwise would be able to. Is it complex though? No, it's super easy to set up, only a couple of clicks, you can go through the process so quickly, there's no dilution ever, and if you don't draw on the money, you don't have to pay any interest against it. It's a great solution for fast growing startups and they should all check it out today. So if you wanna go look into it, go to capchase.com slash root. Dude, I finally watched Squid Games. Okay, what do you I think? Mean, I know, I, like, I, used to, I used to talk trash about um, <laughs> like these uh, you know, subtitle shows because I couldn't do it. Um, I always had trouble like reading while watching. And um, first off, I realized that like after two minutes, your mind just somehow adjusts to it and you just like naturally read and are able to watch the show. So I've never really figured out how to do that until recently, but it definitely happens. And so like one thing, I'm over that whole hold up on it um and squid games is insane and i'm like i'm super late to this party i get it everyone talked about squid games like several months ago and it's not that cool anymore but it's uh it's crazy i mean it's like a super interesting human uh really dark but like great quality good acting i, I was like i think it was dope i mean I, I basically don't watch tv so i haven't seen squid games have you seen the mr beast squid games reenactment no Oh, you have to watch that. Have you seen the like whole all the hype around this? Like he released this. He did spent like seven weeks putting together like a real life reenactment of Squid Games. Obviously not killing people, um, <laughs> but got like a hundred million views in like seventy two hours. Or something I did like see that. that on Twitter. The stats on it were complete. Yeah. I mean that guy's legit visionary. Is that what got you into Squid Games? Yeah. You, you like saw it. You're like, oh, yeah. I should probably watch that. Mm -hmm. Which is fascinating, actually, as like a case study on how creators can like add value to these platforms. Because he banged the video. He obviously did really well on the actual video. The whole thing got sponsored, 100 million views. Like he's making a bunch of money on it. Um, but the amount of value that I imagine it added back in like driving a resurgence of Squid Games into the Netflix platform, and he's not getting or capturing any of that. So it's kind of interesting. Like, could you see a future where? Um, these platforms actually like harness creators to go create cool viral content around it to drive people back. Yeah, that gets me thinking of uh, CC0. Do you know what that is? No. So some NFT projects have what's called Creative Commons, which basically means that uh, the community owns the rights to, um, to the product. So you own a Cryptodes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and Cryptodes like what that means is you actually don't own the IP to that Cryptodes NFT. Anyone, Kevin, our video guy, could go and just print a hat with your Cryptodes on it. And the thesis on it is that if you basically open source the IP, mm -hmm. that anyone could, you know, do things with it, that more creativity is unlocked. And then because of that, 
there's just like more there's more memes around it mm -hmm. and you know if there's more memes around it the value goes back to um you know the value goes back to the original sort of purveyor of the meme in this case cryptos another way to think about it is do you know the the, the remora the remora and shark relationship no so remora is like a fish that basically hangs on to sharks yeah the sticky thing that the like sticky sits thing. on the side yeah, exactly eats the, like cleans it and eats the eats the parasites and stuff. yeah it's the it's the definition of it's a definition of a symbiotic relationship mm -hmm. so that's the idea is that the big shark is cryptodes and the little sharks are these like projects that are kind of built on top of it mm -hmm. baby shark baby shark <laughs> exactly um i think it's kind of a cool idea i don't um so I guess the analog I would use in like a real world uh, would be like people that are creating replicas of certain artwork or certain collectibles, and that actually drives more people and drives value of the actual. Like, but but I don't really know the right way to think about it in a, in a in an NFT sense. I agree with you though. Like the nouns thing that we talked about, like Jack Butcher, our friend, uh, you know, created these like nouns. <laughs> sweatshirts and hats and different things that nouns are like the red glasses that are like cool kind of pixelated things. also cco yeah yeah oh, okay so very cool because then you have a bunch of people out there wearing these things and some of them actually own things that are nouns some of them don't but hugely valuable to the ecosystem around it because it adds this coolness and this vibe to it um so i do feel like there's something there it's an interesting concept though for like netflix or these other platforms that are trying to gain share to collaborate on to like seed interesting creators to create things that stoke viral intrigue in the product it's sort of like guerrilla marketing yeah i mean i think i think that's the future of hollywood mm -hmm. is like it's not you're not gar super guarded on your ip right you, you make it more open i remember i once 2004 or 5 i drove down from montreal to burlington vermont to go see a third eye blind concert <laughs> Love Third Eye Blind, by the way. Semi Charmed Life is still like one of my favorite songs of all time. So I'm there. I'm at the concert with like my best friends, and I had just gotten a Audio Vox cell phone with a camera on it. Um, I even think I actually I brought a digital camera as well, like an actual digital camera, and I was really stoked. And then when we got there, the venue Higher Ground in Burlington, Vermont. We, uh, we like me and my friends started taking pictures and they were like there's no pictures and it was this whole big thing where third eye blind doesn't want anyone to take pictures and i remember thinking back then like 2004 2005 whatever it was like that doesn't make any sense yeah. like the more pictures i take and share on social the better it is for you right like i'm taking pictures of third of, of you the singer of third eye blind i'm posting i'm like i had such a great time like and i think uh that's kind of the same aha moment I, i'm having with a lot of like hollywood productions where you're either like very guarded or unguarded and the ones that are going to win are going to be unguarded are there platforms this is it's making me want to ask a question to you you might know the answer you might not are there platforms or like infrastructure for small companies to track and manage their ip so like disney has thousands of people that are dedicated to this probably and are like tr constantly tracking hits on different IP and what it's doing and the value of it. But like if you're a small uh, creator or you're a small Web3 project or you're like up and coming, you don't really, you have all this IP, you have it out there in the wild. Maybe you're just a startup actually and you have your brand or your logo, uh, whatever it might be. Like are there platforms that allow you to actually track uh, hits on that IP the like perceived value of it because the ip by the way um in traditional financial services context has value like you can go get a loan against ip um and actually have cash that comes in from it so i wonder whether you could build a platform um because i haven't seen it exist that actually just helps companies especially content related companies track and manage and like kind of uh, leverage the value of their ip more readily i haven't seen anything i think what you're describing is basically like hootsuite but for ip mm. so instead of tracking like tweets instagram posts whatever you're tracking like your digital ip yeah uh, or non-digital ip yeah in like a really like nice dashboard 
Probably a great business idea there. It's kind of like a niched down yeah. version. It's like a kind of cool little niche though. But like, um, you know, every startup does the whole like in the wild thing where like they have their Slack channel or whatever they're operating on. And they're like, oh, I saw, uh, I don't know, swag up in the wild. And you're like, saw the picture of this thing. Or like, oh, I saw a party round sticker in the wild or mercury in the wild, whatever it is. Um and that there's actually something really powerful in that right like if you are seeing it in the wild more being able to actually track and manage the value of that and track the perceived value of what you're creating and then figure out like what are the levers we can be pulling to increase that value it's kind of a cool idea i think like the bigger idea slash framework is that there's some you know you started off by saying like disney has thousands of employees probably doing this thing Mm -hmm. and it's like how do you take basically that software that they've built that's proprietary and bring it to everyone else so the idea like the framework for it is like what are what are you know and and facebook is notorious for this stripe is notorious for this where they have amazing internal software and just bringing that to everyone else this is this is an amazing framework so this is like um I forget who I recently talked about. It might have been like our friend Sean Puri that I talked about this with. But, oh no, it was Bob Ack. Um, we have a friend, Bob Ack, who is an investor, debut capital, um, small fund that's doing all black and Latinx founders. And they backed this company, Squire. It's like this barbershop yep. platform. Um, and basically it's for like mom and pop type barbershops. And it brought the like management tool software of huge salons and barbershops like big chains and scaled that down so that any mom and pop could have the best in class tool and that like he was talking about it in the context of that that is a very cool framework for starting businesses go find like what the largest company is doing and doing really well so in this case disney what what are they using for ip management defense ip defense would be a part of this of like who's infringing on your ip and not using it appropriately and then um figure out what that looks like and what's like the atomic unit of that that you could bring and give to startups as a small tool or give to, um, you know, smaller companies as a tool. Yeah, and maybe that's the case for, like, going to work at one of these big companies is, like, you're getting a first-hand look at the potentially greatest internal software and then you can just use that and bring it to different verticals. Yeah, or you just go talk to 20 people at some of these companies. But, like, I think the coolest version of this actually would be for co- for creators. So I like it for startups. I think it's interesting because they mm-hmm. have cash and their stuff. But like an up and coming Mr. Beast, he's bigger now. An up and coming Mr. Beast is producing all this content. Um, all of it is kind of their face or their brand around it. They might be TikTok, YouTube. They have it across all these different channels. People are resharing it, uh, taking the videos, doing like talking about Mr. Beast stuff, whatever it is, all over these different platforms. Can you give them a tool that allows them to track and manage all of their personal name brand creator IP that exists out there so that they can kind of track their like perceived net worth almost in the value of like what they're building as a personal brand? Yeah, I would even do it like give it away for free. Mm -hmm. Just get like everyone on it. Yeah. Um, And then monetize how like you, you could monetize, I guess, on the back of that with sponsor you like you you become the connection point because you're tracking the value of the ip so you know um all of the hits on it you're able to then be like a marketplace that's connecting different brands in for the actual ads on it um you could help them actually by like connecting them with services to scale the quality of their ip because you're constantly in the flow of seeing what they're producing and how it's being reused and how much and the k factor on all of it um yeah, it's interesting. I, I mean, like it. Financial services stuff on the back of it. It's kind of an interesting thing. Yeah. I like that framework a lot, though, just to like double down on that of go find what the huge company is doing that they're doing extremely well and that they've probably spent tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars developing plus hundreds of people. Go find that and niche that down into a product that is like just what is exactly needed for smaller players. Like You don't need the Disney full suite of services probably if you're a creator or if you're a startup. So you find what is like the atomic unit of that that works really well, that's valuable, and you go pull it down into the smaller universe. And make it freemium. Like make some free component. Like for example, I'm an investor in a company called VidIQ, Mm -hmm. which is basically started off as like a free Chrome extension Mm -hmm. um, for creators to see, you know, on YouTube specifically. 
what is their vidIQ score? They have this kind of you know unique score. What are their video tags? And it just allows like it's competitive analysis for the video space. And they started off by giving out for free, and then they started adding like paid products and stuff like that. But I think that like obviously the best way to like win a market is just to like give it away for free. Mm -hmm. And then as you're learning about it, then you just add paid products, monthly subscription. And like vidIQ is an example, that business is absolutely crushing it. Totally agree. Two huge opportunities I see in two totally different industries to apply this. One, Twitter analytics. So there's like ILO is one that I've seen, follower wonk is another. No offense to them, but like I, I've used both and I just think there's a lot to be wanted from the platform. And so I think you could go create like a beautiful intuitive version of that. It's free up to 10,000 followers. And then if you have more than that, you need to pay um, and just create like exactly what a massive brand is using to track and manage other social like a Hootsuite or whatever. But you kind of have brought it down to something that's very actionable for a Twitter creator. Go talk to 100 people that have a scale following. Talk to me, talk to Greg, talk to whoever and figure out what exactly we would use and need. Like we're booking guests for our show. I really want to be able to search by location find who lives there, what they do, like how big their influence score is, like all of these different things that I can kind of do it with ILO and with follower wonk, but it's not great and it's not quick and easy and I can't like plug in an assistant to do it or do something like that. So I think that's one opportunity that could be really big. The other one would be transportation and logistics. Like I've talked to, I have a, a driver who kind of helps me a lot in New York. I've talked to a bunch, she drives for Uber. I talked to her about all her problems and one of the biggest issues she has, she's trying to figure out how to scale her own time as she builds her business. Right now, it's just a time for money trade for her and she's doing well, but she wants to take it to the next level. But she keeps telling me like, oh, but it's such a headache if I hire someone then like dispatch and dealing with bookings and dealing with when they're driving our private clients and doing all of that would be really difficult. And I was asking her, like, what exists? There has to be a software that you can do this. And she said LimoSys is the main one people use in New York. And so I went and looked at it. And it literally, like it says, been around 35 years, whatever. Right. It's like this old company that's been around for forever. I'm sure it's fine for, like, taxi companies and these old, you know, dial seven, the old stuff. But, like, if you are a young, she's a young woman that's trying to build this. She's tech savvy. She's digitally native. Why doesn't just a very simple dispatch and like driver management tool exist where you could like take what the big huge limo companies are using and just scale it down to this? Yeah, I think whenever you hear that, like the word headache, basically, it's like a light bulb should go off in your head yeah. where you're like, okay, amazing startup opportunity right there. So yeah. I think with this in particular, like, yeah, it makes complete sense. Yeah. And you could go, I mean... That doesn't have to be a venture back business, by the way. Like you yeah. could probably build that with low code, no code tools, figure out like whatever the dispatch looks like, figure out some algorithm for it with one or two people, and then go find a hundred drivers to test it out. And you could pretty quickly figure out whether it works or not and do it in a geo focus, start in New York, start wherever, and see if you could scale something. Maybe it already exists, but the fact that this woman was like, limo sis is the option. I pulled it up on my phone. I'm like, <laughs> it's not mobile enabled, the website. I'm like scrolling, it didn't fit the screen. And right away I was like, oh my God, a non-mobile enabled website from a company that's supposed to be the de facto player, like red flag. <laughs> well, that's another like sign, right? Like. <laughs> That's like a really, that's, I've never even thought about that. But if like, go like find mobily unoptimized websites in like f for big businesses. And like, if you're, you're looking for a business idea, like go compete with them. Right. Totally. And just make it like digitally native, yeah. mobile first. This is our friend Nick Huber's uh, thing where he says, uh, you go like see who's still, who has a fax number on their <laughs> on their like page or if you go to their facility and they have like a fax machine there you just know that they're ready to be right. disrupted it's like the exact same framework of to short those companies yeah seriously yeah. i mean you short them by going and attacking their market share um but i think this is interesting so um i know we've riffed on this for a while we have an awesome guest coming in yep. um one of my favorite people in the world cat cole incredible like multidisciplinary thinker she's been an operator she's been an investor she's a life coach ceo whisperer i mean she's done so many different things um and i know it's going to be a wide-ranging discussion i do want to get her perspective on a bunch of this stuff i want to talk to her about the whole idea of like niching down things that exist for huge companies and i think in the context of coaching that idea is really interesting like 
CEOs, Tim Cook, Jeff Bezos, they have CEO coaches that are these incredible people. We're talking to them. Why doesn't that exist down for normal people, middle managers, like up and coming startup CEOs? And so I think there's an interesting concept to kind of go deeper with her on that, given her specific knowledge. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I've had a coach for a while too, so would love to get her opinion on it. Personal experience. Love it. All right, let's bring her in. Cool. What is Marlo? So Marlo is and essentially an atomized coaching app. Okay. And they take the mechanics of coaching. So feedback, 360 feedback, metrics, ongoing feedback, reporting directly to the person and basically have digitized the non kind of like non unique elements of okay. coaching and are putting it in hundreds of companies and taking coaching all the way down to the, like the, I don't want to say the word lowest common denominator, but to any level of people manager and spreading it throughout the organization in a cost-effective way. There is a human coach element, but you get all this feedback that's just automatic and then recommended steps, Mm. but then you get a coach once a month, but it's being spread across that whole company. And so there are these other insights, right? If you have a coach that's spending 30 minutes with you, 30 minutes with you, the coach is going to be able to step back and give the executive team some insights like, hey, in addition to what the data is saying about your 200 people managers, I'm talking to 50 of them. And here are some common themes. So the there are like actual insights and data, and then there's still a human element, which scared away some investors at first. Um, but it, if you talk to any, any big company, that is the issue is that there is still an element of confidential reflection that's needed for a manager to process what they're seeing, even if you give them really great data. I I love it. I'm I'm just on their website. I love how specific they are. So like you go to the website, it says you can't even see the website until it says every manager deserves a coach. Which is like kind of a hot take, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's like put your name and email to actually access the actual website. Um, So you access it. Mm -hmm. So you put in your your email. They're like, check your inbox. They send a PDF overview of like why. And I I love I love that they're just starting with the why. Yeah, it's interesting. It is really really interesting. interesting. And it's also an interesting example of, I guess there's a couple interesting things that I draw. By the way, I'm not an advisor or an investor. I met them mentoring Jason Kalkanis' Launch 21. Yeah. Nice. um, And was so blown away. That's cool. By her that I had a follow on. I didn't see that one. I saw, um, there's a business called Scale that's doing coaching. Um, uh, Chief product officer, I think from Tinder. Um, was mm-hmm. starting it. That was pretty interesting. They were raising money recently. You should meet with them, chat with them at some point. Super interesting. I've always thought about these as like the consumer facing side, which is like a Marlowe or a scale where um, you have to like win customers. And Marlowe sounds interesting because they're kind of taking the B2B approach of they like are. going and landing the client and then you can go and get yeah. as many people as they, you want. It can it. be B2C or B2B. Yeah. And it gets smarter as you have more people on it and there's product led growth within the organization because. I'm like if me and Greg are in the same company and they're offering this and I'm not using it and I'm not growing as much as Greg and he's getting promoted, suddenly I'm like, oh, shit, I got to get on this thing. I got to be using it in the same way. For sure. So it's kind of a smart selling tactic. The other approach would be just going infrastructure layer and saying um, like practice, which I'm an investor in, full disclosure, Julian Smith, the founder of Breather, has started this thing and it's infrastructure for coaches. Um, and it's, you know, managing their bookings, managing that whole experience, which again goes to this whole idea of taking what massive people probably have expensive software and all these things and bringing it down to any coach. So if I'm a coach and I have 10 clients, I need a way to manage bookings and retention and track all of that. And so they're building a product for that small subgroup, basically taking a bet on, and this is the reason I like infrastructure personally. I know coaching is going to be a much bigger thing Mm -hmm. 10 years from now than it is today because people are starting to get more in tune with their own personality traits, feedback being an important thing, uh, spirituality Mm -hmm. as an aspect of it. And that was always a thing where you were like, oh, no, I'm tough. I got to just grind through it, whatever, put my head down. Like hustle culture was kind of the last iteration. And now we're realizing, no, that's not the way to grow. 
And so the infrastructure to me is a cool play on it because then you don't have I don't have to bet on who wins. I just get to bet on hey the space is going to be ten times as big in a few years, and so I I want to ride that wave. Yeah, it's it's also interesting this division of coaching the life coach versus the career manager coach and where should they overlap for scale? I mean, it's hard to get away from the psychological element, but not all coaches have the same level of capability, training, some are therapists, some are not. It's really interesting when you get into coach and people are like, well, what kind? Like, am I Mm -hmm. gonna have someone making me draw circles and talk about my dad and Mm. (laughs) you know all of this stuff or is someone just going to help me be a better people manager and is there a way to do that without any of the life coach so what do you guys think about that i've never had a coach so i want to ask your opinions on this of like what do you think? Should and I don't know the, if you want to go both? this deep in this. I'm not even no, spending I do. that much time on coaching. So. No, I, I know <laughs> you're not, but you know, you know about it. There are a lot of people who consider you, I whether or not you're formally their coach, they consider you a coach and a, <laughs> probably both a life coach to talk to them about <laughs> challenges of becoming an operator, CEO, investor, all the things you've done. But like, what, what do you, I mean, you have a coach or you've had a coach. Yeah. Is it a life coach? Is it a purely executive coach? Is it both? I mean, I feel like for us, like our lives and our personal lives and professional lives, really bleed yeah. into one. So I feel like having a coach that's just focused on professional doesn't really make sense anymore. Yeah. You, I mean, at some point you're going to hit a wall you're gonna with those hit conversations exactly. where it's like, okay, what I'm, what we're working on has deeper roots than this business. Exactly. <laughs> so we're going to have to break through the dirt. And that's when you get into this personal, like there's shit going on at home or... Um, there is something from your childhood that's causing a behavior that you don't realize that all your people are picking up on and reflecting back to you. I mean, it's, it's almost impossible to stop at the mm-hmm. surface. Exactly. I had a, I had a co- coach for a few years and that coach like helped me basically sell my last company islands to WeWork, like just through the whole process. Mm. And I would say like 30% of the stuff we worked on was literally business like tactical professional stuff and 70 percent was like hey like why are why do you want to sell the company oh it actually stems from this you know uh you want validation or something you know and 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 really like prying and that's why like yeah i think the best coaches do have that personal plus uh professional kind of way of thinking about it and i think that's the harder part to do at scale Yes. You know, something at a Marlowe or any of these companies that are breaking it down into its parts and getting feedback, at some point it requires a human touch, like right. a one on one. You can't AI your way to like mm-hmm. your issues with your mom. And in, you in, and it needs to be <laughs> intimate. It needs to be intimate. Yes. Uh, like there needs to be a like trust. A trust, like blind trust, mm-hmm. like completely blind trust. That's what's interesting about. Marlowe or platforms like it where they're pairing together the human coaching element with the data-driven feedback, the process orientation, and that is scaring away some companies and it's scaring away some investors, but I think it's the right way. Right. Yeah. I think it's the way to do it right over time. It just may slow down. What I like up. about Marlowe is that it it's getting people who wouldn't have a coach something. Yeah, so exactly. So it's like get them started and then from there like let them potentially, oh, oh, you know, I never thought a coach would actually be, you know, valuable. It's that tagline on the, on the website, yeah. the statement of, to your point, where the world is going, why shouldn't everyone have access to some form of professionalized, structured, rooted in expertise feedback, and then some guidance with what to do with that feedback? I mean, that has its own limitations, but if every manager had that from the time they began managing got used to soliciting feedback, receiving it, and doing something about it, like ask, answer, act, and being a part of a culture where that's normal. Imagine what they would be like when they're mm-hmm. executives and CEOs. And There deal. has to be, like the point you made about investors being scared off by the fact that there's a human element here cracks me up because it's like, first off, I just think that's dumb. Like, yeah, there's a human element. But there's huge businesses now being built around mental health, as an example, mm-hmm. for companies. like. Um, Spring Health, Lira yeah. are both multi-billion dollar companies backed by like Tiger and some of the biggest you know investors in the world. And 
clearly there's a human aspect that's selling basically B2B mental health okay. services. And then there's actual, you know, mental health coaches, psychiatrists. Like I think there's actually clinical aspects to it, but clearly that's human and everyone knows that has to be yeah, human. Yeah. And so it's almost like, it's almost a, it seems like a silly pushback where people just think, oh, coaching and feedback can be automated. And so it should be. And I'm not going to invest if there's a human element. Because but it the can't real- scale in an unbridled, right. <laughs> unhuman yeah. way. Right. right. Exa- but there has to be multiple billion dollar businesses within performance coaching as that industry becomes as big as it should be. I, I think about the lost GDP from the fact that there are people who are not maximizing their mm-hmm. skills and they're leaving talent on the table because you have... In a in a big corporate, you worked in a big corporation. I've never done that, but even in a yeah. um, you know finance org, like I was at a private equity fund, and in a in that there are people that literally get left behind. We talk about not leaving children behind when they're mm-hmm. in school, but that happens in organizations every single day. Thousands of people are getting left behind because they're not getting consistent feedback. They're not given the tools to actually grow and get better at the things they're they're deficient in. Yeah. And so to me, I look at it and I say, as an organization. If I'm a CEO or a board member at a company, I want this because it's making all my employees more productive mm-hmm. and it's a no-brainer. Um, if I'm a person, I want my company to have this because it's allowing me to scale up, which I'm going to make more money and take care of my family, so I care. Um, but I don't know how you could look at that and say, oh, there's no there's no billion-dollar-plus outcome within this industry because there's a human element. That just feels short-sighted to me. Not to mention one of the greatest challenges of our time is labor and staffing at all levels, and you talk to any founder, any CEO, any investor or board, what are what are their biggest challenges? They're in this bucket of finding talent. And getting people coaches at all levels increases the likelihood that some of your talent moves up from within, and you don't have to go find it externally. And then the retention is higher, and the cultural knowledge is higher, and they're all, it shouldn't be everyone, but more from inside an organization should be able to move up than often yeah. do. Less catered lunches, more performance <laughs> coaching. Seriously, like, oh, great, I have my kombucha on tap and you have my, like, nice catered lunch. Who cares about that? That's commoditized at this point. This feels like the next yeah. layer of, of that. Like, oh, you're giving me things to level up my career, to become better at the things that you're telling me I'm not great at, giving me more consistent feedback. Um, I recently read an article about becoming a feedback magnet and how the greatest mm-hmm. leaders are feedback magnets. Um, Shivani Barry, I think, was the person that wrote it. Um, she runs a, a course called Ascend, which is like a leadership program for women. Very, very cool. Um, and she wrote this great piece. I think it was a first round review article. They mm-hmm. published it. And it was this idea of being a feedback magnet. And I'd never thought about it that way. Of Like the best leaders are feedback oh, magnets. Yeah. They're constantly wanting feedback because um, there's so many times when you like shy away from it or are scared of feedback because you feel like it's a criticism on you rather than flipping it the entire opposite way of this is a huge opportunity for me to get better at whatever it is i think there's there's a way to reframe feedback in not just someone having a shitty experience and having the courage to tell you and you having the gumption to digest it but literally feedback as in a radio Mm. it's signal it's just signal i mean when i worked for hooters and i was running the training department so i was a I don't know, 24-year-old director of training for the corporate office. And when I would lead these workshops for managers and for franchisees, whenever we would go on breaks, we'd, you know, I'd go in the restroom, pee in the stall, and then stay in the stall so I could hear what people were saying. And I never used the info. I know it sounds creepy, but I never used the information for evil. I never told anyone. Um, there was one time where I heard something was that was against the law, and so I had to do something about it pretty overtly. But even if it was just people saying, the music sucks on the break, or these snacks aren't great, or that guy in the corner is distracting. Granted, I was only hearing the women's version because this is before the all-gender restrooms, Um, but I still had feedback. I had intel, and then I magically corrected these things. Like It was just not about me. Sometimes the feedback was me. Man, I wish you would stop saying that word. That's so annoying. Or when she does this, it's annoying. And I'm like, great to know fix. Just this constant, constant iteration. I've been so obsessed with the true truth, which is other people's truth, not mine. And if and if you frame it that way, one, the ego is completely removed. It's not about me. It's about their experience. And yes, their experience is a reflection of me. This is true for coaching, managing, putting on events, audiences, community, whatever. 
and just caring about their experience and then deciding what's signal versus noise, you know, where are the patterns versus the one-off, and then doing something about it. And so ask, answer, act. Sometimes ask is just listen. Uh, and then create an environment, or in my case, eavesdrop on an environment where people are speaking the truth, which they tend to do, washing their hands in the restroom uh, beside their classmates, and then do something about it. And just to your point of a feedback magnet, and then soliciting it. So doing check-ins and Mm -hmm. asking for it. And that starts to not only give you the things to act on, but it builds a culture where you don't have to ask for it as often. How do you... So I think it's, I mean, that's an amazing example, first off. It's like <laughs> also crazy, like, super crazy. Amazing. Like, <laughs> makes sense that you were on, like, multiple episodes of Undercover Boss. You were an undercover boss before you were an undercover boss. That's true. <laughs> well, that's well true. so many people have, have asked, like, wow, did you learn something, you know, life-changing or transformational? And, and the answer is yes, because, of course, the experience was unbelievable. And I don't want to sound like an asshole when I say, but not really, because I've, I've always believed in being there in the trenches, listening, asking. I don't typically have a wig on and really bad makeup <laughs> to try to pretend I'm not who I am. But when I was traveling around the world opening franchises, every time I was in a country, I'd never been there. I was leading a team I had never met. They had never met each other. They were coming from all over the world to be a part of a team, to open a new brand, to launch literally a new entity and brand in a new country for the first time. There is no trust. There is no familiarity. Most people don't assume trust and start at 100 and give you a chance to go down. They start at something lower and you have to build it. And this idea of being able to build trust, rally people around a common cause, iterate as the experience evolves to get to a common outcome every time in a different place with a different team. I was building that muscle when I was 19 years old because I, you know, there was no playbook. Like you have no choice. Mm. You have to know the true truth. You have to ask people for their experience because if they don't do the work, the store doesn't get open. And if you don't get feedback from them and understand their experience, there's a lot of friction. And to your point of productivity, you don't have productivity. And so coaching, feedback, check-ins, like all these mechanisms to ask, answer, and act, to listen, and then iterate, literally lead to the best leadership outcomes. So I think 95% of people are sensitive to feedback. I don't know if you agree or disagree. I was going to ask the same question. And my question to you is how, like what advice do you give to people to help them be less sensitive? And it makes sense why they're sensitive. It's like, especially, of course. yeah, especially if you're like, I think about it as like, uh, you're like a chef at a restaurant and then you're creating this, you're spending all this Somebody time. Somebody your food sauce. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's you. It's like you're putting yourself into yeah. the thing. It's yeah. your artwork, whatever it is. So how do you develop that? thick skin like how, how you, you clearly had it somewhat intrinsically probably if you were able to do that at 24 but like to listeners even myself trying to embrace and become a feedback magnet like how do you actually do that do you have to remove yourself from it like what's the most people would say find a way to remove the ego and remove yourself but that's a very difficult piece of counsel especially yeah. for people who take pride in their work yeah it usually comes from a really good place like, and not I tactical care. it's not tactical because it's like that's okay right. what is the ego like that's honestly right. what yes. is that we're going to get into a okay. very meta discussion yeah. 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 what is self yeah, yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> who am i who am yeah. I? <laughs> but i do have we a... just do mushrooms <laughs> <laughs> You'll never know. Yeah. Microdose before this episode. We're good. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Just kidding. If anyone. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> um, but I have a pretty tactical approach, which is if the, the fear of feedback is around the optics of failing, however you define failing failing to be perfect, failing to be wildly successful, failing to do what everyone needs at all times, failing to delight, you know, whatever that is. I just redefine failure. Fail, so go farther up funnel of the psychology. I redefine failure as first attempt in learning. Like, of course, when there are new elements, and the reality is there are always new elements. There is no way the playbook of yesterday works for this. There's no way what I did with 30 different humans in a different country is going to be exactly the approach for a different country and 30 additionally unique variables. And so failure's first attempt in learning. Failure is not, um, you know, preventing, or failure is not having issues. 
Failure is not someone being disappointed. That's not failure. Failure is just fail, F-A-I-L, first attempt in learning. And then this definition then of what is my role? My role as a server, go back to the chef example, the restaurant example when I was a Hooters girl, is for them to have food they love, an experience they like, so they spend the most and tip me the most. That's it. Like my proximity to feedback, the feedback loop in that business is, it's not even a line. The dots are like laying on top of each other. You cannot escape people's reaction to what you in the business have prepared. It's this amazing training ground for digesting feedback because they're like, I hate this or it's not what I wanted. And you literally have to fix it. You can't be like, oh, that makes me scared. I'm going to go hide in the bathroom. <laughs> like you got to fix the wings and, and make it not about you. I remember so many times we had two wing sauces, mild and three mile. They sound a lot alike in a loud restaurant. And so sometimes three mile would get delivered, which is blazing effing hot. <laughs> And when they ordered mild and they would take a bite and it was an unfortunate incident. And I'd have to say, I'm so, you know, could have been them, could have been me, but say, I'm so sorry. That is not what you wanted or needed. I will get back on it right away. Right. It's about them. And I don't beat myself up that I made a mistake because what's really important is just fixing it and them having a great experience. And then, oh, by the way, here's some extra ranch and celery. You're going to need it after accidentally Here's eating three miles. <laughs> um, and, and making it better, even better because there was a mistake. So this idea of reframing, reframing failure um, has been empowering to me, going back to that Hooters sit in the restroom, listen to what people say, and then iterate on their feedback example. Failure would have been letting the experience be suboptimal. Failure would have been not correcting the things in their mind. It's in their mind no matter what. Don't I want to know it? And then I have the choice to do something about it. Or maybe it's not something I change, but I can explain a bit later of why things are the way that they are. It's literally why I implemented the MMDD log, made my day difficult log. In every restaurant I've ever opened, this was guidance from like a 1980s restaurant consultant where he'd say, do an MMDD log. Let the staff tell you what makes their day difficult, find the patterns, fix it. So literally every opening I had a clipboard at the back door, before you left, you had to write the one thing that made your day the most difficult. Sometimes the answer was me. Um, luckily, we had a culture where obviously people felt comfortable saying, cat's confusing us with these instructions. Um, but then I could find the patterns, come back the next day, fix the top few things, or if I wasn't going to fix it, say, hey, this is making everyone's day difficult. Here's why we can't fix it right now. So I see you, I hear you, let's try to smooth it out around the edges but it's, I actually can't change, so don't spend your energy. Or I disagree, maybe something bigger at the corporate level. Um, I disagree that this should change. Here's why I've clearly done a bad job of explaining the benefits. So I have used a literal version of the MMDD log for 20 years in business. It's now a Slack channel in all the companies I run and advise, uh, or an email if the culture isn't comfortable with an open Slack channel. I've used apps where you upvote and downvote what made people stay difficult. The less change, the more often you need to ask. Or the less change, the less often you need to ask. The more change, the more often you need to ask. So if there's a lot of shit going on, it's a made my day difficult every day and every day there's change. If it's you know a little more spread out, you can do it once a week, once a month, but this literally is soliciting feedback and building uh, feedback magnets in the organization. I do it in departments because not everyone needs to know about everyone's feedback, but then department leaders need to talk and if there's something that is consistent across the company, it rises to the level of the executive team to get it's addressed. It's also a startup. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to you and I'm like, okay, Kat, like, how do I invest? You know, like, how do you productize this? Like, I don't know if it's a Slack bot or an email with like a dashboard. The branding would be perfect. Um, I see it now. I love it. Um, I literally implemented this. For yeah. decades, it could literally be called business. like feedback magnet. Like, literally, yeah. it, it's just a thing that like gets dropped into twenty places in the organization. Feed mag, yeah. feed mag, Seriously. feed mag. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think it's, it. it's a cool idea. It's a cool it's, idea. It might be, maybe not the most game-changing practice in a company, but in the top three. Well, I, I mean, I experienced it firsthand in the context of my own career, where like I would get to a year-end review. Like we had a two review cycle was our standard, which maybe is standard in corporate America. Mm -hmm. Like you have a mid-year review and then yep. a year end. 
And there would literally be things that would come up in my year interview that I had no idea Sucks I was doing wrong. And I would show up and be like, how how did I not know that that was an issue? How did I not know my hair was so good? Uh, well, I, do, I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, like it, that is crazy. And that is a lot of GDP and growth for that company That's left right. on the table when that happened. So feedback or whatever we end up calling it. <laughs> um, maybe it's, I, 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 there's like a very simple way to implement it yeah. too. It's just constant feedback. Like you have an interaction with someone, they should be able to rate that interaction. It's kind of, there was a, um, there was a Black Mirror episode. Did you ever watch that show on oh, Netflix, yeah. Black oh, yeah. Mirror, where like yeah. you would rate your interaction with someone? Like I would see you, yes. and it was augmented reality, and then I'd be like, oh, five stars for Cat, like two stars for Greg. Didn't really like that. Here's why, whatever. And during the course of the day, you'd have like a buildup of different interactions, different things that would kind of rate your experience. But that could be in a corporate setting. Like if I have a meeting with someone and I feel like they didn't come in as prepared as they should have been, or they didn't deliver the insights in a you know short form enough. Um, to be able to iterate on that and then at the end of the day get a report or end of a week of things I can be working on and thinking about, super yeah. cool. One of the things I noticed as I pushed this <laughs> feedback practice, he's like, this is happening. Uh, yeah. this like, is happening. I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> as I pushed this feedback in practice to leaders who were then getting it that weren't me, right? It's one thing if I'm comfortable with it, I redefine failure, I'm a feedback magnet, I'm doing it, that's great. But when I start to push it to other managers, who then are implementing it. There's still a lot of psychology and emotions to the whole point of where we've gone with this discussion underneath how to take it. And so if you put in this feedback bot <laughs> magnet, some MMDD log made my day difficult log, there must be an accompanying alignment around anyone who is in charge of receiving and acting on the feedback around the attitude, the culture, the removal of ego to the extent that it's unproductive. Like you do have to have that as the side dish <laughs> to this thing in a company in order for the people who are being asked to give feedback to do so candidly and frequently. Otherwise, we all know how it plays out, right? Someone gets it and is like, that's bullshit. Or someone gets it and they're like, oh, that's me. I, I, I don't know how to process it or deal with it. Or these people suck. They don't know what they're talking about, right? You have those managers as well who don't respect the people giving the feedback and discount it. And so this can be quite revealing across the organization of the need to create feedback magnets, of the need to have discussions and coaching <laughs> around feedback culture. And can, like, don't we want to know? Don't we want to act on it? If we don't, our competition will. If we don't, someone else will. I think the really cool thing about it too is that it creates a very real stake in the ground that you can then track against. So like if I know mm -hmm. from the first month, here are the five things that consistently come up about me as a manager, or as a uh, peer, and um, now this is what I'm going to get mm -hmm. reviewed against or comped against is going to be my ability to take that stake in the ground and improve it. And so if I was getting rated as a three on communication, you know, efficiency or something, I need yeah. to make that to a four. And so I'm just going to be thinking about that constantly because I know that at the end of the year or at the mid year, whatever my bonus or my review comp is going to be based on my ability to actually improve those like five things that have consistently come up. And so it's kind of cool to think about how then it plays into the ability of orgs to actually action on, um, you know, performance reviews mm -hmm. and promotions and bonuses and all of those things to make them more. I just always hated the arbitrary aspect of that pay. It's like, oh, did my boss like me? And was I nice to them? And did I do stuff for them? Versus did I actually make real progress and get better at the things I was supposed to be getting better at? So it's kind of cool. Could um, be an interesting component. And yeah. to your point of patterns over time, so you know, my husband and I do these monthly check-ins that many people have heard. Yes. Cool. So it is feedback. And so since the month we met, we decided that we wanted to be as good for each other at home as we are in business. And I'd never felt that way in previous relationships. I mean, I wanted the relationship to be good, but I never thought I want to be an amazing partner. Mm. But I did when I met him and he did as well. And so we're like, all right, if we care and if we want that and we want to be proactive about it, where can we take inspiration for how to do that? And of course, the answer was business and our, our leadership roles. And so we scheduled a monthly check-in. We asked the same questions every month. 
What's been the best part of the last 30 days? What's been the worst part of the last 30 days? Tell me one thing I can do differently to be a better partner for you. And that is either a stop, a start, or a continue. What has worried you the most in the last 30 days? What has given you the most pride? And what are you most grateful for? Every 30 days since we have met, we have asked and answered those questions to each other. Sometimes it only takes 15 minutes, max. Other times it creates a deeper discussion we don't hold off real-time feedback for that place, but that place, that space is held for the purpose of feedback on anything touching the relationship, which could be work. And this check-in format I've used in business for over a decade as well. So sometimes since it's about work, the thing that has worried them the most that affects them at work is something at home. So it's not a heart to your point of, it's not a hard line and there's not a big wall there. There are things that affect who you are in this piece of your world that come from other pieces and there should be permission to talk about that but it's still primarily focused on the area and those monthly check-ins which are not okrs they're not checking in on kpis you're not talking about deliverables and mm. performance it's just those questions has been i mean i don't know our relationship without it but i can tell you the people who've adopted their own version of it after hearing about it have said this has changed my marriage or this has changed my direct report relationship with my executives. There's something about that going in, tapping in to just where you are. And that question, tell me one thing I can do differently to be a better partner for you, is very interesting to see the patterns over time. This is another <laughs> startup idea, by the way. And there's gonna be too many coming out of this episode. <laughs> but like that should be in an app or some easy format where like I would love to do that with my wife. Yeah. I think that's super interesting. And if like you could make it really easy. Six moleskins full yeah, of exactly. handwritten notes and it, it sucks to but not like, be able to like It's a really cool like if I'm just on the go and I wanna like put plug something in or I'm thinking about it, it's kind of a cool idea to just have like a super simple web or app interface where you could check in. Like we have all of this for when you first start dating, Hinge exists. There's all the algorithm and you're connecting and it's like trying to match you at the outset. But then there's nothing really, as far as I know, that exists for like later on. Now you're in a relationship or you're married and you're trying to track these things and track the progress of your relationship. You want to hopefully have a curve where you're growing over time in your proximity and in you know the depth of your relationship yeah. and, and you change. And so there's different things that change about your life. You have a kid, you don't have a kid, you're like getting old, your kid leaves, totally. all these different phases. And so the ability to like track it over time, look at the data over time for these people that are more data oriented and not like, you know, KPIs and yeah. all this and that, but just like to find patterns. just to, it mm -hmm. kind of provides like a journaling plus real feedback element to it. That's kind of cool to pull together. And it's, it is interesting to see when you talk about the, one of the questions, which can be the most emotional, which is what's worried you the most in the last 30 days. Um, to see how that evolves over time. And even with my direct reports, executives, right? Sometimes it's the health of a parent, money, um, or something directly in the business. Like my team is just not jelly. It's very interesting yeah. to your point of being able to look back and go, look how far you've come. Remember when that was the thing that was worrying you the most? And remember when that was the thing that was the worst yeah. three months in a row? Look how far. So, yeah, that's amazing. We'll add it to the list. I, uh, <laughs> I need to add, I know we're starting to get close to the, to the end of our time together. I need to ask you a question that relates sort of broadly to your career and experiences. But one of the things I've admired about you as a friend and as a mentor, a person I look up to is um, you're extremely open to new ideas, experiences, people, cultures. Um, you've shown it with your going down the rabbit hole and red pill on web three <laughs> and how deep into that world you've gotten and how you've embraced My PFPs it. are cartoons half of the time. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a, it's a, um, it's a personality trait you clearly have and that you've embraced. And I read an amazing story about you from early in your career, I think of an experience you had in the middle East. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's a perfect example of this trait that you have. And I think a lot of people will benefit from hearing it. So I would love for you to just tell this story. Yeah, I was uh, traveling in Egypt, visiting my franchisees, and um, it's, this was with Cinnabon, and the Gulf is the largest market outside the U.S. for Cinnabon. There's How like, old were you at the time? Uh, 31. Okay. New president of Cinnabon, taking Crazy. over the global business. And I had, for the past two years, I had also spent some time in, in Turkey and fell in love with the Adan, the call to prayer. I mean, when the loudspeakers would blast, it was... 
it touched my soul. It was like meditative. And so much so that I had an app on my phone with the Adan, with a call to prayer from every major country that, that has it. So there's different tones and different oh. speeds and it's really cool. Anyone can like look it up in the app store, just look up a dawn or call to prayer and a bunch of them will come up. And, um, and I really have no religion to speak of personally. And I just thought it was beautiful. And so I had this on my phone. I'm in Egypt, we're driving through and then the call to prayer comes on. We pull over Two people, you know, need to go pray. And, um, and this happened a couple times, but throughout that, the, my franchisee that was in the car, it, when it came on, I just said, this is so beautiful. Can we roll down the windows? You know, I really wanted to hear it. The music was on. Can we turn down the music so I can hear it? And he was blown away. He was blown away that a, an American, a non-Muslim, like all the things you can imagine that this was a narrative violation in this moment. And he had he got teary. And it started this whole different conversation together about my appreciation for it. I showed him my app. He didn't even know there was an app, like with all of these countries, and he thought that was really cool. And we were already totally vibing. It was, he's just a super cool guy. But it took our relationship to a very different level quickly. And he saw me as, a, I don't know, a family member, a more connected human, because I just said something that clearly articulated, I thought something about his culture, was beautiful. And on its face. Like, I don't know what they're saying. I mean, I know a bit more now, but at the time, I'm like, I literally have no idea what they're saying. I just think it's so beautiful. And it created this moment that accelerated trust and a common bond that led to better business, you know, and it just went on. I'm still yeah. dear friends with the franchisees well all over the world, but certainly in this region today. I, I believe that that moment did something with our relationship where I became more like family than this very hospitable culture would have already treated me. Um, that lasted throughout my my term as you know president of the brand and even into being president of many brands with the parent company. And it made it easier for me to call and say, hey, do you want to be a franchisee of Jamba Juice? And hey, I mean, it led to big business and big growth over time around the world. And similar things happened, but that was a really unique one. And you didn't go into it. What I think is so amazing about the story is that that wasn't why you did it. No. You didn't say, you weren't like, oh, this could be a big business moment for me. Let me like kind of play my way. It was just, you yeah. were, that was who yeah. you were. I'm not that strategic. It. But it's sort of, the, I mean, there's an amazing lesson in there of just like you said, narrative violation, like be a narrative violation. Just embrace different cultures, different people, different ideas. Talk to the random person on the street that you come across. You end up coming up with random startup ideas. You build these relationships that you never know how they extend. You never know where those trees kind of lead you and those branches unless you open yeah. yourself to it. I love, I used to call myself a walking conflict of interest, not because mm. I was, but because I knew that's how some saw me. I was a Hooters girl and I was advocating for women's rights. I was running Cinnabon and investing in the future of health and wellness. And, and it's not that I was atoning for my sins. You know, I'm the same person who saw purpose and mission in these things as I'm on my own personal journey and in fact, that makes me more of a bridge person because I'm not preaching to the converted. I'm someone with a hand in one world, a hand in another, authentically, not trying to have no opinion or no point of view or be neutral, but literally find beauty here and find beauty here and live in both worlds where many people don't. It's one of the things I'm loving about Web3 mm -hmm. and NFTs, like this, you know, anonymity and um, just leaning into Web3 and then people coming together IRL and you put some of these groups together and every one of them would acknowledge we might not have ever met, we may not have otherwise been in other circles. It looks like a narrative violation. It's amazing. But it's actually not. It's, it's actually, amazing. it is the way. I, also, I think it's the best. Yeah. I also like how, I like how you use the word authenticity because it reminds me of, because, you know, I, I know you were not strategic, but I think from... A marketing perspective like being authentic obviously is such a great way to grow your brand yeah and you're seeing this with web3 like nft communities that are taking off but it reminds me of the story of like in quebec people don't drink coca-cola they drink pepsi mm -hmm. and the reason why they drink pepsi is because when coca-cola and pepsi when coca-cola came to quebec 
they basically use the same ads that they use for the rest of Canada. Mm -hmm. And they're just like, okay, there's these French people who live here. We're just going to translate it into French. Like Literally the worst country to make that decision. The, the worst, worst country. Yeah. <laughs> and it was complete. like people were like, you know, uh, absolutely not. And then Pepsi came and they crafted a message that yeah. was so authentic to that group of people. And they kind of went, you know, they went, anti-coke in a lot of ways they just basically learned from the mistakes and to this day pepsi is everywhere i have a funny story a so yeah. i uh brought the first hooters uh to quebec gatineau quebec oh, yeah and we had not thoughtfully evolved the business we're open to it but other than what was required by law which was the menu being in french and english there wasn't really any other overture to say, we are here for you. And there are certain places, certain cities, countries, states. Boston is another one as a city in the U.S. Where if you aren't like of the people, by the people, from the Boston, people, for so the I people. <laughs> it's yeah. one of the worst cities for chains as a result. And if you don't figure out how to really grow from within, you are doomed. And I remember it wasn't until the last day. I was there for almost 30 days that the team warmed up. It was brutal. I mean, it was the toughest time in building trust and relationships I had in any country, anywhere in the world, out of 80 countries. Because of this, one, it was a pattern of American brands entering the space without the respect and partnership. So there was just this wall up. And it took us, while we're trying to train and deliver and get our poutine right and all of the other things on the menu and trying to get my American trainers to not you know, react and poke fun, but to just be curious, like be curious and help make it happen. Um, it was so high friction. And at the end, there were tears and hugs and appreciation, but it wasn't as natural as that, you know, Egypt story. It was, um, it was, there was a lot more, you don't want to be here and we don't want you here. Yeah. And it's you in our land, as opposed to our thing that we're building together. And about a week into the training, I scrapped it all. I scrapped the menu, scrapped the recipes, had a, like a do-over meeting with the team where all we did was listen and learn in French, listen to people talking about their restaurants that are their favorite, how they think this type of food has a place in their world. I mean, I should have done that day one, but I'm proud that I had the courage to still do it day eight. Quebec is the only place in the world where Starbucks isn't called Starbucks and KFC is not called KFC. I believe it. It's called, you know, KFC is called PFK. Poulet Free mm -hmm. Kentucky, which is hilarious. Yep. Um, Starbucks is called Le Café Starbucks. And they they do, you know, I think it's a lesson learned, mm -hmm. right, for these brands. Um, That's right. To make people feel at home. And I think, you know, there's that saying, uh, if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. But if you're a marketing person, if you can make it in Quebec, you can make it anywhere. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> because, and that, that's what I think I learned from that experience of, is if you're going to be a community builder, you do have to, uh, you have to not talk and listen, I guess is the big sort of uh, lesson there. And then once you've listened, you really understand the people, then you can understand what are the nuances that they have that I can build product around so that I can serve them. I mean, literally, a listening leader is a learning leader and a learning leader is a lasting leader. Mm. And you're never done. That's good. I mean, that it's, this, yeah. it's this <laughs> deep, yeah. uh, this interesting listening full circle. Listening le leader is a learning, learning leader. leader. Learning leader, leader is, is a lasting leader. leader. Boom. That's good. And that's a good, get that tattooed on my yeah, chest. No, no, no. Yeah. I think that's a good place to, uh, I think that's a good place to wrap up. Yeah. I know we got to get you out to uh, whatever your next event is as well. So thank you so much for coming in and joining yes. us. Thank yeah. you. Awesome so as always. So much fun. You guys I like <laughs> constantly learn so much from just being around you. So I feel privileged that we get to do this somehow for a living. <laughs> so cool. This is awesome. It's so the future cool. and we love it. So thank you, you so much, Kat. You. Yeah, You're the best. Great. Thank you. <laughs> So we covered a whole hell of a lot that episode. So I don't know how you're going to do this, but what was your one big takeaway? I think my biggest takeaway is how important it is for all of us, startup founders, startup employees, employees, creators, to find a coach and use a coach to become uh, just the best version of yourself. And I know that's easy to say, and it's hard to find a coach and they're expensive, 
But I think that, um, you know, even if it's, you know, once a month, once every two months, once every three months, or even using some of those automated solutions that Kat was talking about, um, I think, uh, I think it's pretty crucial. So go, just go one layer deeper for me. Like how can someone go find a coach? Like what, what, what's the step to take for someone that actually wants to go do that and action on it? Is it like Google search? Are you talking to people? You tweet it out? Like how do you actually go find a coach? I mean, I think, I think, you know, first is you just ask around, ask friends, join discords, come into our discord and just ask, and maybe we can provide some recommendations. The hardest part about finding a coach and Kat, you know, Kat kind of mentioned it is finding someone you can trust. So I think it's like a very personal decision also, like what, you know, what might, what might be a great coach for myself might not be a good coach for you because you just might not just connect with that person. So I think it's going on, you know, step one, going on discord going on twitter asking around step two going on google setting up like there's the there's a bunch of marketplaces that you can kind of like go and uh have video chats with some of these people just to get a sense of it um and then feel it out and set up a budget for it and this is like your invest in yourself budget um maybe it's a couple hundred bucks a month maybe it's a couple hundred bucks every three months whatever you can afford and and use that to you know, work on one or two, three or three things that uh, are affecting your professional life that even might stem from your personal life. Super, super interesting. Something for me to think about personally too, because I've never had a coach yeah. uh, in this context. So yeah. definitely something for me to reflect on more. Um, Time for a coach, child. Yeah. I loved all the startup ideas, man. We had so many in that episode, which was crazy to go through. But like the whole concept of taking something that the big companies have and have built, finding the atomic unit of that and delivering it to a smaller group of niche down, smaller community is such a cool concept to me. Like whether it's for transportation with the Uber drivers that I talked about, um, you know, whether it's the coaching solution that we talked about and, and, and applying it here. Um, and then the feedback, feedback and dating or the feedback <laughs> and relationships uh, app ideas were really, really cool. So I'm, I'm excited. There was like a lot out of there that I want to jump into the community, want to get in there and talk about more. Let's talk about all these startup ideas. Let's talk about coaches, see if we can get, help some people get more of that coaching and maybe some peer to peer coaching couldn't even happen as a result of it so we want to jump in there let's get into the community let's talk more about it look forward to seeing you in there see you in there capchase is the financing solution for fast growing startups it lets companies access their revenue today so that they can reinvest in their business and grow and scale much quicker than they otherwise would be able to is it complex though no it's super easy to set up only a couple of clicks you can go through the process so quickly there's no dilution ever. And if you don't draw on the money, you don't have to pay any interest against it. It's a great solution for fast growing startups and they should all check it out today. So if you wanna go look into it, go to capchase.com room. The saying used to be, let your game speak. With Common Stock, it's about let your gains speak. I love Common Stock, love the platform and have really been enjoying learning from other people on there. How does it work? It's a platform for verified investment knowledge. So people are going and sharing their ideas, sharing their trades, but it's actually connected to their brokerage account. So you can see the results they're generating and see their actual track records over time. So you're learning from people, not only the best investors, the Bill Ackmans, the Daniel Loeb's are on there, but also individuals who are actually going and putting their money where their mouth is on these trades, and you're learning alongside them and being taken on the journey. Is it just stocks? There's everything now. There's gonna be stocks, there's crypto. We're in this crazy world where there's so many different investment opportunities, which just means there's so many opportunities to learn. And Common Stock is creating the platform for you to learn alongside the best. And also, as I said, let your gains speak. So to level up your investing game today, check out commonstock.com. You won't regret it. Join our free community at trwih.com. 